Hello and welcome to another episode of Investing with IBD. It's Justin Nielsen, your host, and uh, Rusha Pierce isn't joining me this week. He'll be back next week. Uh, he had to take a little break, but we have on as our special guest returning to the show, Dr. Thomas Carr, also known as Dr. Stocks, uh, big into momentum trading and a uh, lot of information that he's going to be sharing with us today. Uh, welcome back to the show, Dr. Stocks. Thank you, Justin. It's great to be back. I appreciate your your invite and good to see you again. And great to be able to share with your uh, listeners a bit about the market today. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely been an interesting market lately. And yeah. specifically what we're going to get into today is uh, some of uh, Dr. Carr's rules on momentum trading, why to do it, what to look for. Uh, and he's going to show us some screens that he runs in order to get uh, some of the stocks on his radar. So uh, first of all, let's go ahead and start with the market. Um, if you don't mind, I mean, this has been, you know, such a grand start to the year. And then we had this uh, little pullback, which, I mean, when, when, when you consider when you consider the move that the NASDAQ had, I mean, over 40%, uh, it, it's not unusual for it to come down as much as it did. But what does this do for your momentum kind of style when you have a little bit of a break in that momentum after such a strong start? Well, the the little pullback or correction or little blip in the uptrend, however you want to call it, was very much uh, expected by mm -hmm. most people who have been watching the markets and who also are kind of clued into seasonal patterns as well. Right. Um, August tends to be pretty volatile. And after a five or six month uptrend heading into August, it's almost always lower uh, than the previous month. Mm -hmm. um, September also can be kind of volatile. So we're sort of in that that pitch between the summer doldrums and the Santa rally that we'll probably get at the end of the year. And no one is too surprised that we're getting a bit of a pullback here. So it's actually quite good. I mean, we, 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 want, we want to see those prices consolidate. We want to see uh, the moment, the price momentum got a little bit ahead of itself. We want to see yeah. that uh, catch up or allow valuations to catch up. And we're also in the third quarter of a pre-presidential election year. Yeah. And of all the 16 quarters of the presidential cycle, this happens to be the weakest one quarter three mm -hmm. of the third year. So again, uh, no real surprise that we're seeing a bit of a pullback. Mm -hmm. um, fr frankly, for momentum trading, this is a great thing because it takes a lot of the risk out of the trade. If we can kind of catch those places where money is inflowing into, uh, you know, there's always a bull market somewhere. If we can catch those niches of real inflows, then, um, you know, we can still make some good money on the upside. But frankly, we've been um, hedging the market for the last few weeks and now okay. starting to cover those and uh, starting to put money to work on the long side again. OK, so you, you talked about, you know, some of the areas that maybe you were shifting some money uh, sector rotation. What what areas have you been kind of looking at based on momentum right now? Well, um, you know, we've got these kind of two dynamics going on in in the overall macro picture of the market, the economy. We've got the, the fear of the Fed that it's going to not take its foot off the brake pedal. And we've just come through the sharpest and shortest rate hike cycle in, in history. <laughs> right. Uh, and so I'm showing the 10 year, I'm, I'm showing the 10 year treasury right now, the 10 year treasury yeah. yield. And you can see how, I mean, from September, you know, or, or I guess March, 2020, the lows there, how, how much it's come up just on the 10 year yield. No, exactly. Ten, ten, uh, 17 year highs uh, this mm -hmm. week for the 10 year yield. And we've got a pretty good eye on the 20 year bond fund because that to me is kind of the, 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 the meat of the bond spread. And we're starting to see today, we've got a really nice bounce back. And I think um, part so of you're that talking about is TLT there. TLT. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. TLT. Mm -hmm. we're, we're actually long TMF. We bought some of that this morning, which is a leveraged version of TLT. Mm. Uh, so we've got these two things going on. We've got the fear of the Fed slowing things down, and we've got the fear of recession that the Fed's, you know, doing it too too fast, too quickly. Mm -hmm. And we've had you know Dix and Footlocker come out this week oh, yeah. with really bad earnings, getting just yeah. whacked like crazy. Peloton was down huge today, so there's certainly signs that the consumer is starting to pull back quite a bit. 
Uh, we'll get dur durable goods orders uh, tomorrow, and so that'll be pretty closely watched. Um, but you know, a lot of folks have got maxed out credit cards. They're seeing their interest rates go up. Uh, their 4.2% 4, 4 drop in mortgage new applications today. Um, so there are some signs that uh, the recession fear mm -hmm. is also beginning to creep back into the the macro picture. Yeah. Um, but I'm still I'm still hopeful. I have to say, still hopeful that the Fed is has paused, and I think they're not going to hike again this year, and that they may even start cutting rates by the end of the year, and that should help grease the skids a little bit. Okay. So uh, yeah, for a while there, it seemed like the market was definitely looking at potential cuts uh, by the Fed at the end of the year. And then, you know, the the, the, the futures on that just really kind of uh, <laughs> went, went downhill uh, as, as right. people are like, oh, the, the Fed keeps on raising and they're, they're maybe, you know, going a little bit longer in their, in their hike cycle. Um, but let's, let's turn back a little bit to the, the retail that you mentioned. And again, I mean, mm -hmm. Especially in the U.S., the consumer is so important, and this earnings season has been another one where there's been such volatility. Uh, it, it seems like for a lot of stocks, you're either up, you know, you're up big or you're down big. And uh, you know, you, you brought up Dix and uh, Foot Locker as some of the recent, um, you know, uh, casualties. But on the flip side, you had uh, a, what was it, Abercrombie and Fitch, uh, ANF. You know, that had. Uh, you know, 20% move to the upside on its earnings. Um, so how do you, right. how do you go through a, an earnings cycle? You know, uh, when momentum is looking good and some of these, they looked great before they got clobbered. So mm -hmm. how, do, how do you handle things like that with the earnings? Well, generally we stay away from playing earnings. Uh, we stay out ahead of okay. the earnings uh, announcement because it's, pretty much of a coin flip. And we've seen something very unusual this quarter. That is that most companies, the vast majority of companies have out uh, outbid the expectations by quite a, a bit. We're seeing companies raise their expectations for quarter four and for 2024. At the same time, we've had one of the worst um, performances of stocks after earnings. So the good, you know, two to three weeks after earnings, we're seeing a lot of stocks selling off on the news. Mm -hmm. So uh, the market, I think, was clearly ready and primed for a pullback. And I think some of these retail plays, I mean, you've got Walmart up and you've got Target down. So yeah. uh, Home Depot and Lowe's, they're not really in sync as much as they used to be. We just stay out of retail for the most part because it can be really, really uh, uh, crazy, like biotech, you know, crazy sector to trade. Um, but ne all that said, uh, it we, we were not surprised to see some pretty heavy hits to mm -hmm. some of the stocks that really had gotten ahead of their valuations. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to just real quickly go back to your your, your bond trade. You mentioned, um, you know, whether it's TLT or the leveraged version. Um, this kind of seems counter to momentum. I mean, this is, you know, the, the momentum was going the other way here. So right. what was it about uh, were you using technical action that, OK, this was just oversold and it was time for a bounce? Were you using macro? Hey, we think that, you know, there's going to be a cut later on in the in the year and you know, recession fears are going to outweigh inflation fears. You know, what was it that kind of made this trade look appealing to you? Well, it certainly wasn't the price momentum. That, that's for sure. <laughs> right. so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Explain it's, it's yourself here. Right? Yeah, it's down in the dumps and it's been down for a long time. And we're really just playing a sort of a peak in rate cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, we've, we've been in an inverted yield curve for 10, 11 months now, almost a year. Mm -hmm. And that is not sustainable. The yield rates going sky high, that's not sustainable. And if we do have recession fear coming in, kicking up again, which I think we're starting to get this week, uh, bonds will do well. Bonds and gold should should do fairly well if we start to get people worried about uh, the, the consumer in the, the general retail economy. Mm -hmm. So there was really a thesis trade, I guess we could say. Um, the system that I'll talk about here in a little bit is a pure momentum play on price, coupled with several fundamental metrics that we'll talk about one by one. And when you put those pieces together, you get stocks that are in an uptrend that have sustainability over the near term. 
Uh-huh. And uh, this is not that kind of trade. So we're really okay. talking about two very different approaches to the market. We use half a dozen different approaches. So mm-hmm. always good to be diversified that way. Yeah, have have some different tools in your toolbox. Um, exactly. exactly right. since, yeah. since, since we're on the topic, uh, maybe maybe it's worth talking a little bit about the dollar, the strength in the dollar. Does that does that come into play with, you know, I mean, you mentioned gold, uh, you know, a lot of times that, you know, that has its relationship to the dollar, you know, uh, commodities, mm-hmm. oil, gas, that's been perking up a little bit lately. Um, so is, is the dollar and its strength kind of factoring into any of your, your trading right now? Yeah, and we're, we're actually hopeful um, that the dollar is beginning to roll over. It ran up into some, some technical resistance and has got overextended. And, um, you know, it's starting to do a little bit of a pullback here. And gold and silver both shot up quite, quite strongly today, uh, along with bonds. So when, when the dollar, of course, is the dollar is a good barometer for the overall economy and for growth and GDP and all of that. But when the dollar is too strong, uh, it makes our, our national stocks not very attractive to foreign investors. So mm-hmm. uh, we kind of want to see the dollar come, come off a bit and see gold bonds and silver commodities rise. And I think that will be a good signal for the market that uh, we're we're going to get some good inflows now, um, and maybe a lot of cash that has moved to the sidelines because things did get overvalued will start to come back in again. Mm-hmm. And so, when you're playing um, when you're playing gold or silver, are you going with like your GLD, um, you know, the 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 Spider Gold shares, SLV, which is the iShares Silver Trust, or what 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 are you using for for those trades? Yeah, we've had quite a few gold trades on this year, and um, the the my favorite instrument is the MGC, which is the micro e mini futures contract. Okay, I don't know so, if you can bring up a chart of that, but um, yeah, no, no, not not on not on MarketSmith because it's a futures. No, so, no that, yeah, that's yeah. fine. Uh-huh. But it is it is the the tiniest futures contract. It's one tenth of a, of the e mini of gold, right. and gold is the e mini gold is one tenth of the of the big contract. Mm-hmm. So it's a great way of, uh, you know, adding on some extra protection. We use the micros quite a bit for hedging and uh, shorting the market when we need to add some protection. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's but, definitely uh, easier that, a little bit using those micros. You can kind of fine tune things a little bit uh, as opposed to when exactly. you're using the full yeah, and you full can, size contract. You uh, in, yeah, you can leg in and there's not much in the way of, um, you, you don't have to worry about time decay as you do with the options. Uh, mm-hmm. We'll, we'll sometimes use options on SPY and QQQ, that kind of thing. But the micros are a, an easier way. They're very liquid, easy to get in and out of, and uh, and they don't require a big account. So I've been training right. some of my smaller account traders to day trade micro e-minis. You can day mm-hmm. trade the futures all day long. You don't have to have the $25,000 pattern day trade account. Mm-hmm. And uh, they've, they've had some good success with that. Mm-hmm. Very good. Um, and uh, just to kind of put a bow on stuff, uh, if we turn back to the the, the Nasdaq, I want to just get your thoughts on um, the, the the change in breadth. Uh, so yeah. certainly at the beginning of this year, one of the things was, you know, okay, we're looking at the market and the market looks great, but it was so narrow. You know, we had what we, right. we were calling the Magnificent Seven, um, and then it seemed like. Things were broadening out. You had more participation. Um, I'm just going to pull up, uh, you know, two two quick charts here. Uh, the GMIAB, which is in MarketSmith, shows you the advanced decline line of the Nasdaq. And you know, again, this was starting to improve in May, um, getting back in July, and then just really kind of uh, took a dive. So, how much? You know, you said that there's a there's a bull market somewhere, but Man, it seems like it's hard harder to find when you've got the advancers, uh, advanced decline line looking so dismal. Yeah, and no, you raise a great point. Um, the breadth as we've had it this year to date is really not sustainable. And I think one of two things can happen. Either money starts coming out of the, the blue chip stocks and the overall indexes fall, or money starts going into the beaten down names that haven't been playing along this year so far. And we've got some really interesting names that are down in that second category. A lot of software companies. Um, you've got, for example, um, I can't think of the, the name of the company, but the ticker symbol is UPST. 
yeah. which uh, shot way up. I mean, way up this year, and then just crashed well, then right down. Crashed way down. Crashed and, way down. Because, dropped yeah, so this is upstart, and we have to upstart, also remember upstart. that's it. That it had this big move up after its IPO, yeah. really crashed, and then had another, you know, just phenomenal move. And I mean, right. this, just a couple of weeks ago, it was down forty four percent in a single week. So yeah, right. uh, so, so so what what was it that you're seeing here? Well. Upstart for me is kind of a thesis trade as well, in the sense that it is a, uh, a proprietary software approach right. to uh, evaluating loan loan applications for mortgages mm -hmm. primarily, but they're now starting to move into cars and other big ticket items. And they're on the state on the verge of putting something like FICO out of business because mm -hmm. their AI uh, configuration algorithm uses uh, 500 different data points and FICO only uses five. Mm -hmm. So they've really got a great product um, and the market was catching on. And then the mortgage rate started going up and loan applications started going down. And that's what right. hit them, you know, mm -hmm. and they're also quite leveraged. They have a lot of debt, that sort of thing. So it's not a safe play by any means. But I'm, I'm looking if breadth is going to expand, especially in the NASDAQ, we're, we're going to want to see stocks like that start to have a good day. Mm -hmm. um, a, a good way of tracking that is ARKK, you know, Kathy yeah. Wood's uh, fund. And because she buys a lot of that growth. Kind of stuff. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's right. And she was uh -huh. big on Tesla. She's kind of reducing her Tesla now. Uh, that's still, I think, their number one holding. But she has Teladoc and Upstart mm -hmm. and uh, um SE, the, the Singapore games company, mm -hmm. uh, APP, and a number of other sort of up-and-coming um, disruptor-type companies. And if her stock, I mean, they, they actually had a good uh, several months, and then it went way down. It tagged right. the 200-period moving average, bounced a little bit this week. If that can start getting traction again, um, I think we're going to see a much healthier breadth. Mm -hmm. But, you know, We'll trade whatever's moving. So if yeah. if the QQQ is only moving on five or six stocks at the top of the weighted index, then we'll trade QQQ, whatever, mm -hmm. whatever is moving up. Yeah. So to that point, when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about the momentum that you're looking for, what your what your rules are, and uh, we'll get into some depth there on how you find the stocks that are most likely to work. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Trading Apple, sometimes you get the bear. Sometimes it gets you. Single stock daily leveraged and inverse ETFs from Direction. Before investing, carefully consider a fund's objectives, risks, charges, and expenses contained in the prospectus at Direction.com. Read carefully. Welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast. It's Justin Nielsen here, along with my special guest this week, Dr. Stocks, uh, Dr. Thomas Carr, uh, returning guest and uh, really into momentum trading. So uh, let's get right into it. Um, what, what, initially got you interested in momentum trading. What was it about it that uh, appealed to you? Well, uh, that's a good question. Um, you know, when I first started trading back in 1996 and then lost all my money, took it up again in 1998, lost most of my money, took it up again in 2000. <laughs> I, I realized that I really had to learn more about the dynamics of the market. Um, and one of the things I learned in that is that you, you can take uh, a longer term view and buy uh, good companies at cheap prices and hold on to them for years and make very good money in the market. No problem. Mm -hmm. But the other approach to the market, it's a much more short term approach. And the idea is that you catch stocks when they are in favor with the market. The market is affirming their their business plan, affirming their growth projections, affirming everything that they do. And the market's very happy with that stock and it goes up and that's the momentum stock. And the beauty of the momentum trading is that momentum stocks themselves tend to go uh, up the highest in the mm -hmm. shortest amount of time. Mm -hmm. And of course, so when you time say is short term, a, yeah, when you say short term, can you just tell me yeah. real quick, what, what kind of time frame are you talking about? Well, what is a short that's time also a good you? question. That, that really okay. changes with the market character. Okay. So when we're in a low volatility, nicely, complacently bullish market, uh, we can hang on to our trades for weeks, even months at a time. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. We're in we're in much more of a choppy, range bound, uh, more volatile market right now, and so our time frame has gotten a lot shorter, mm-hmm. uh, several days to a couple of weeks, maybe at the most. Okay. So we're trying to catch the the shorter swings in the market uh, in a market like this, but when the market's happy and and happy and clappy, then we like to take the longer view. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, you know, if you are sitting in a stock and you you know the company's great, you know the growth prospects are great, it's inevitably going to go through periods of contraction, and mm-hmm. you're going to sit in that stock for several months at a time where it goes nowhere or where you see your profits dwindle. Uh, momentum trading doesn't do that, so you want to make sure that you're getting in a stock that's already on the move up. You hang on to it for as long as that trend is going, and when it starts to peter out, you get out and find a new a new stock to trade. Mm-hmm. And and what kind of because um, again there's always this push and pull of you know when you're when you got a stock how long do you hold on to it how how much is enough to expect out of it when do you have the heart out of the watermelon uh, and there's certainly you can either sell into strength um, and you know we never think we're going to sell at the top you know so you might sell into strength and it goes up further without you or you're selling into weakness and you know, you don't know, is this going to be just a temporary correction, a little pullback, and then it's going to, you know, jaunt up without you? Or is this something that's more serious? So how are you telling the difference um, and, and kind of gauging? Well, yeah, that's a great thing. You know, Jesse Livermore is famous for saying never buy the bottom and sell before it gets to the top. <laughs> and so that's kind of what we do, right? So uh, there are some tools and tips and tricks that we can use. Uh, we use the linear regression channel to determine when the, a stock is uh, down at the 2.0, 1.5 and 2.0 standard deviation away from the mean of the trend. Okay. And that's usually a place where we like to buy. When it gets up to 1.5 to 2.0 standard deviations above the mean of the trend, that's usually the time we look to sell. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's that's one tip that we use. We also look at volume balance. Uh, For example, you look at the QQQ or the SPY heading into uh, July, uh, late June, early July, you're going to see a lot of um, big distribution days with Mm -hmm. William O'Neill. And I learned this from him. Yeah, William O'Neill called distribution days where you have a higher volume profile versus the day before, but it's on a selling day as opposed to a buying day. Right. And you saw a lot of that in late June, early July. So th- those are kind of some tips, too, that you can uh, use to figure out when something is ready to roll over for a while. Mm-hmm. Now, how does Eugene Fama uh, come into this? You, you you brought him up in your notes. Uh, yeah. And he's, of course, a lot of times associated with, you know, portfolio theory, uh, efficient market theory. Uh, not Not what you would expect to be associated with momentum. Well, and he's not. Um, he's kind of the the opposite of the momentum trader. He's the an- antagonist to those that uh, believe they can make a good living from trading momentum stocks. He's famous, of course, for the efficient market theory. Uh, he won the Nobel Prize for for econom- uh, econom- uh, economics in uh, 2013. But it was way back in the late 60s when he started to develop this idea that the market always knows exactly uh, every data point that it needs to interpret the appropriate price at that point in time, uh, because all the information is out there, right? It's, it's all, all priced in. <laughs> it's all priced in. Everything's mm-hmm. already priced in. And if that's true, and if we can't know data points in the future, and that those data points might send the market up or down, and we have no way of predicting that, then the best thing you can do is dollar cost average and buy yourself a a mutual fund that is widely diversified and just hang on for years and years. So that was a a big part of the investing story until the 1990s came along and this massive bull market spurred by Greenspan and and, uh, some more uh, deregulation of, of the economy. And people started pulling money out of the mutual funds and putting them into individual stocks, anything with a dot-com name right. <laughs> uh, was going sky high and people were making big money. So that's when momentum trading really was was brought back to life again, I guess, after the, the period of the Fama, uh, uh, you know, sl- 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 period where momentum trading was out of favor. 
Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so he's he's a brilliant mind. I don't want to downgrade his theory at all, but he, he had two two fatal flaws. And one is that he was understanding the market as a present discounting mechanism, i.e. it's discounting everything that we know up till now, mm -hmm. when in fact, in my opinion, at least the market is a future discounting mechanism. It's, right. it's a speculative mechanism, and it always has been ever since mm -hmm. the days of the bucket shop. Yeah. So if it's about the future, then the efficient market theory doesn't quite hold water. Mm -hmm. And yes, speculation can be wrong, but there are all kinds of ways of noting patterns, both technical patterns and fundamental patterns and seeing acceleration and things, uh, things like earning estimate revisions going up and seeing analysts stepping in with upgrades that can give us a pretty good picture of what's likely to happen. We can also do our analysis of uh, future growth prospects for the sector of the economy that the company is in and mm -hmm. all kinds of ways of getting a clear picture of putting some edge, some probability on our side, looking ahead, looking forward. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that was his fatal flaw was that he could not account for price momentum. You know, uh, was it Helen, Helen Meisler, who might have been on your program at some time, but she's on CNBC quite a lot. She, she's famous for saying that changes in price make changes in sentiment. Mm -hmm. And that's really true about a company or the market in general. When prices are going up, people start liking that company and then it, it snowballs. Momentum begets momentum, as yeah. Jesse Livermore also said. So... Uh, he couldn't account for that in his theory. And he actually made uh, admission to that effect. It was on a, uh, a talk show back in the 80s. And he said, the one thing my theory cannot account for is price momentum, because it tends to sustain even beyond where we would expect it to be given all the data that we know. Yeah. And, and that just to me, it seems like it's such a an aspect of mass psychology that comes into play there, um, right. which is which has always been again my my problem when reading efficient market hypothesis uh, type right. stuff. It's you know hey you can see the market in a bunch of numbers, <laughs> right? The market can be a bunch of numbers and charts mm -hmm. and lines on a chart, or you can see the market as people. Yeah, and it's really people. <laughs> yeah, people right. making choices, pushing buttons, clicking the mouse, mm -hmm. and that's moving the price needle up or down. Yeah, so and that's always where that the work of like uh, Kahneman and Tversky, you know, uh, you know, the the behavioral science aspect yes, kind exactly. of comes into play. Exactly, right. a little bit of psychology can go a long way with with a market <laughs> prediction. Yeah, so so when you talk about momentum, I mean, you know, price momentum is certainly a big thing. So, are, are you just looking at it on the chart? Are you using relative strength? What's what's your favorite kind of indicator that you use? Well, that's kind of what I wanted to talk to your your uh, viewers about today. Um, back in 2012, and this was the culmination of, of several years of hit or miss uh, experimenting with momentum trading, I, I wanted to see what would happen if I simply bought the best performing stocks, the top three best performing stocks in the market at that time. What if I just mm -hmm. bought them, held them for a month, and then at the end of the month, take the next set of three stocks, if they were any different, and swap them out for the new ones. What would mm -hmm. happen if I did that? So mm -hmm. I put together a very simple scanning tool. And if you show your viewers that first slide there, mm -hmm. um, I used a scan to weed out of the market stocks that were priced over $10 a share that had average volume over 100,000 shares. Over a 20-week period, I took the top 20 stocks by price increase, percentage price increase. And then of those 20, took the top 10 over a 12-week period. And of those 10, took the top three over a four-week period. Ran that, swapped them out every four weeks. And if you show slide number two, you'll see the results of just doing that. And they were pretty poor. In fact, uh, you would have lost quite a bit of money in a very strong bull market. So, so just just so uh, for people that are listening to this, um, we, we've got two lines here in the S and P 500 uh, over five years, uh, measuring from 2009 to 2014, and it looks like uh, you have like roughly a about 170 percent uh, for that. And then uh, the the system that you just mentioned uh, is this green line down here uh, using that system of top three momentum stocks and it looks like it did you know pretty well at, at the start um but then 
over the five year period, it ends up down, uh, down 50%. That's right. And it, it's going to have periods of, of outperformance, but for the most part, it's a losing uh, battle. I've back tested it over a 20 year period. You end up losing all your money by the time you get to the end of the 20th year. So it's not a winning system. So I started experimenting. So why with on that. earth are you doing momentum if it doesn't work? Well, the, <laughs> <laughs> the principle, the principle behind it is a solid one, but we have to find the right stocks with okay. that kind of price momentum. It's nothing wrong with the price momentum itself. It's the kind of stocks that tend to end up in that category without any other qualifications. So I started experimenting with all kinds of different parameters. And the first thing that I stuck in there that really worked was the price to sales ratio, a valuation ratio. Now, a lot of great momentum stocks don't have any real earnings. So Mm -hmm. the price to sales ratio is the one ratio you can use to evaluate these companies on the basis of how expensive are they to the number of sales that they have, the revenues that are bringing in. If you see, if you just put that one parameter into that scan before you do the price increase numbers, you end up with a positive result, uh, something that approached at least the S&P 500. So mm-hmm. that's a really big improvement. Now, you can see it also had a lot of ups and downs uh, and didn't match the S&P 500, which, of course, is we have to at least do that. Yeah. So I knew I was on the right track, but I still needed something else to add in there. Well, and I just the want to describe real I, quick this graph for, yeah. for folks that are listening, because, yeah. you know, the, the, the green line here, I mean, the S&P 500, and I assume this is the same time period, 2009 to 2014. Same time period, yeah. So same mm-hmm. time period. So, you know, S&P 500, you know, had a had a nice, fairly, fairly steady, you know, steady climb, um, a, mm-hmm. a, a lot more noisy with this strategy. So, um, right. I, I mean, that could reflect that sometimes maybe the the price to sales is more in favor than others because it certainly looks like this was well out of favor and then did a lot of catching up in in the last year uh right and and yeah. that's that's not uh, the kind of thing that's sustainable you're you're going to <laughs> not be patient with those long years of drawdown yeah you, you, you kind of wonder how, how how do i avoid the four years of nothing and <laughs> just get that uh get, just get that last year <laughs> right yeah exactly exactly right Uh, And there are times when value stocks are in favor and times when there aren't. And so we want to make sure that we're finding a set of stocks that are more or less in favor most of the time. So the second thing I added in was a growth metric, which makes all kinds of sense. Um, I, you know, IBD's can slim system is built around uh, accelerating growth. The one facet of growth that I discovered was the had the strongest correlation to price increase over the near term. And by near term, I mean two to three months. Okay. Was the earnings estimate revision. Mm. I learned this from Len Zacks. He's a MIT PhD student, a doctoral thesis from MIT. He founded Zacks Investment Research, and he developed a proprietary way of evaluating stocks based on analyst upgrades and earnings estimates. He found that earnings estimates of all the different fundamental metrics that are out there had the strongest correlation to forward price increases. Earnings estimates are going up. Price tends to go up over the next two months or so. Mm -hmm. So we put this in and there are different ways that you can do that. You can do it quarter by quarter. You can do year by year. I did find that year by year, uh, year to year comparison, price estimate increases of at least 5% uh, had a very strong uh, uh, improvement on the system. So here's the slide. You can see the results of this system now with two parameters in the price to sales ratio. This is ratio looking much under, better. Uh, yeah, it looks know, much so, better. So that's right. Uh, the, the that, that's line, an equity strategy, curve that I think most of us could live with. Yeah. Right. And, and, and in fact, in this case, um, what's happened is the, the, the red line, the S&P 500 has gotten scrunched down a little bit because right. the performance of the strategy was so good, um, you know, up there at like 420%. Uh, versus 180 percent during that time period for the S&P 500, and and a lot. I mean, it still has its volatility, but um, not not as much underperformance as as what you saw in, That's in right. the previous strategies. That's right. mm-hmm. And I should add at this point too that just about everything I've said so far, you can program into MarketSmith. Mm-hmm. You can program in, you know, your price and your volume and 
uh, earnings estimate revisions, either for quarter or for annual. And uh, the price to sales ratio is in there as well. And you don't have the, you know, the tw top 20 stocks for this price increase, the top 10, et cetera. But you do have the proprietary relative strength both mm -hmm. for the individual companies and for the sectors that they're in. And if you put those two together, you've got a very good way of finding some very good stocks. And I'll show you a few at the end of our time together today. Okay. Awesome. Um, so the third piece, and this was the final piece, it wasn't the final piece of my eventual system, but it was the, the final piece I can share today. And that is the, um, the, the presence of analysts who are raising their estimates and raising their, uh, their grading of the, of the companies in recent time. And it helps also to kind of figure out whether these analysts are accurate generally or not. There's an easy way of doing that. Uh, but if you have a, a company that has a low price to sales ratio, has been raising earnings estimates, has good price momentum, and you've got the analyst community, especially the five-star analysts supporting that company, you've got a sustainable momentum stock. So you put that third piece in there. Uh, the stocks in our scan have to be at a buy or better by the majority of those that cover the company. And you get this uh, result here, this third result. Yeah. And th th this one is just blowing things out of the water. The S&P 500 has gotten a lot more scrunched down because now the scale has had a change to uh, take into account a 950% plus uh percentage gain for for the strategy and and again it does show uh you know that last year certainly has a big big effect um on it right. but it, it, right. it, it does it does kind of blow the s p 500 out of the water now i just want to take a step back real quick because you said there's a real easy way to figure out which analysts are the ones to kind of watch um how easy is that what do you do well, there's a site secret. that I use. Um, it is a site that uh, you can subscribe to to get premium access to a wide variety of, of helpful information. But you can also just uh, sign up for free and you will have a ranking there of the 7,000 analysts that cover stocks. Mm -hmm. I didn't know there were so many of the, them out there. 7,000 professional analysts at all the different uh, investment houses and as many analysts as there by, are stocks. Uh. Yeah, just about. You're right. Just about. Uh, it will rank them by uh, how many times their buy ratings are higher 12 months later and by what percentage are they mm -hmm. higher. And you get uh, 25 guys at the top who all earn the five star rating. Uh, and you also start to see that there are certain houses that are that really know how to hire good analysts because they all work for the same groups. Right. You've got Jeffries, you've got RBC, you've got Oppenheimer. There are several others. Those are kind of the top three. So if a report comes out from Jeffries, it doesn't really matter who it is. It's something you want to listen to. Mm -hmm. I don't like, I don't know, this kind of dates me, but I used to listen to a commercial on TV, you know, when, when E.F. Hutton speaks, people listen. People listen. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so when when Jeffrey speaks or RBC or Oppenheimer speaks, you, you want to listen to what they're saying. Uh, and 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 where what website uh, should people go to to find that information? Uh, it's called uh, Tip Ranks. T I P R A N K S. And you can type any stock in there, and it will tell you whether it's a strong buy, a moderate buy, a hold, or a sell. Mm -hmm. And we're looking for stocks that are at least a moderate buy, if not a strong buy. If it's a moderate buy, we want to scroll down and see which of the analysts are giving a buy there, how many five-star analysts are there, and how many from Jeffries, RBC, and Oppenheimer. Mm -hmm. And when you start to see those things line up, strong buy, several five-stars that gave ratings not too long ago, maybe within the last month or so, and if uh, if they're from those top houses, then that's a good uh, a good indication you've got a sustainable momentum stock. Mm -hmm. um, and that's tipranks.com. Tipranks.com. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Um, and just to kind of close this out, I I think you had one more slide to show. Um, well, that system that I was working on and that I shared the three parameters with you all here, I've been perfecting over the over time, and it's a big part of my a service that I provide called the Momentum Letter. 
Mm-hmm. And this is the return that we got over that same time period, but with a couple of other individual parameters, we're also looking at market cap, smaller market cap tend to outperform larger market cap, no surprise. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, so it, uh, it's, it's a pretty healthy, uh, pretty healthy return. Yeah. Now, now, you know, this was from 2009 to 2014. Has this been sustainable uh, since then? Uh, does the system still work? And uh, does it work beyond the back test? You know, uh, does it, yeah. has it been working in real time? Well, in real time, I've been offering this letter since uh, December, sorry, January 1st, 2012. And uh, so we're now we're in our 11th year. And last year was our best year ever. We had a, over a 200% return for the three systems that we use. So we use an aggressive small cap momentum system. We use a large cap momentum system that only trades S and P 500 stocks. Mm -hmm. And then we have the three momentum stocks to sell short, Mm -hmm. because if you go back to my first slide, you'll know that uh, selling momentum stocks short can be a pretty profitable thing. So we've added a couple of parameters to that original uh, bare bones screen, and that's been working very well on the short side, even when the market is going up. Uh-huh. So, uh, yeah, so that service has done very well for us. It's it's now my most profitable, uh, most successful service. Very good. Offer. And and I assume that people can find that at your website, drstocks.com? Drstocks.com, yeah, yeah drstoxx.com. Okay, very good. Well, when we come back, uh, we're going to build a screen and take a look at some of the stocks that are popping up on, uh, on the radar here. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Trading Tesla, sometimes you get the bear. Sometimes it gets you. Single stock daily leverage and inverse ETFs from Direction. Before investing, carefully consider a fund's objectives, risk, charges, and expenses contained in the prospectus at Direction.com. Read carefully. Welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast. It's Justin Nielsen here, your host, and Arusha Pierce, who normally joins me every week, is uh, taking a break this week, but he'll be back next week. Uh, but I do have Dr. Thomas Carr, also known as Dr. Stocks. That's with S T O X X. Uh, you can find him at drstocks.com. You can also, uh, he's very active on stock twits. So you can find him at Dr. underscore S T O X X. Um, right now, uh, why don't we go ahead and uh, kind of look at this momentum idea, these these factors that you were looking at, and uh, let's build a screen and see what comes up. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Stocks here, uh, and he's going to use MarketSmith to kind of create this screen. Uh, so tell us um, tell us how you do it. Well, thank you, Justin. And I will be building this in MarketSmith. Um, you can use MarketSmith to do about 80%, maybe 85% of what I just told you about uh, when we were building out the screen piece by piece, the last 15% or so, you'll need to go over to tip ranks and use Mm -hmm. that site to find out where the analysts are. But uh, I've done a little bit of that work already for you. So I've already built the screen into MarketSmith. Let's go ahead and open up MarketSmith now. Uh, We've got the chart of Tesla on here. I've got all the proprietary screens that I've built out for my various uh, trading services here on the left side. And I call the momentum scan that I use call uh, hot stocks. And if we open up that scan and uh, just click on the open edit, and I'll show you the various pieces of this scan. So I start with a current price of $15 per share, which will knock out about 3,000 or so of all the stocks in the MarketSmith database. Uh There's a sweet spot for trading momentum stocks, and it happens to be to be between $15 per share and $40 per share. You're going to get the greatest uh, bang for the buck in that range. When you get under $15 per share, you start getting into stocks that may not be very stable, might have some other issues. As Bill O'Neill liked to say, you know, a cheap stock is usually cheap for a good reason. Um, And over $40 a share, you start to get stocks that don't move nearly as quickly as those under 40. So 15 to 40 is a good sweet spot, but I don't put a high end on that range. I just start with 15. I've got a 50 day average volume of 500,000 shares per day. We're going to be getting in and out of these stocks fairly quickly. Uh, They're not day trades, but maybe after two or three days, the run peters out. Uh, Once a week is usually about the right time to hold on to uh, the stocks that your scan pulls up. And then you run the scan again the next week to see if the stock is still on there. And if it's not, you sell it. So we want to make sure that we can get in and out of these stocks pretty quickly. For that um, 
the, the real growth measurement here, we're using EPS estimate for the current year on a percentage basis having increased at least 5%. Now you're gonna see that there were 1600 stocks that passed through our filter before that. There are only 659 stocks that passed through that particular filter. So that knocks out quite a few of them. Mm -hmm. These are only stocks that are saying to the market, either through a, a corporate call or through an analyst covering the company, we're doing so well, we're selling so many of our widgets, um, we've got so many new customers that our previous estimate for what we're going to earn is too low. We need mm -hmm. to raise it up. That's a very, very good thing. Right. Lens X, as I said, said that's the has the strongest correlation to forward price momentum uh, over the next uh, two to three months. After that, we're putting in our valuation filter price to sales ratio of 1.0. 1 1.0 is would would be about the lowest I would go for price to sales. Otherwise, you're going to screen out too many stocks. You can play around with that filter a little bit, but you don't want to get too far above one. One is sort of your your, your mark for a stock that still has a lot of room to grow because the actual price of the, of the company or the market cap of the company relative to revenue is still very, very low. Mm -hmm. uh, we, now, we need to have in our scan some filters that uh, tell us the stock is trending higher. It, it is, in fact, a momentum stock in the sense that it's moving up. So we put in a relative strength rating of a minimum of 80, and again, you can flip, um, you flip that around a little bit. You can go a little bit higher if you want, 82, 84, 86. Uh, if you're getting too many stocks passing through this filter and in a very strong bull market, you will get too many stocks passing through. So you can filter with that. But right now, 80 is about the right number. I also uh, have just, a, just a quick question. Uh, a quick yes. question on the RS rating. Do you ever play around with um, shorter term RS ratings? Because you could put in like a three month um you know, do you ever do do that or do you stick with the 12 month? No, I haven't. I'm, I'm only using the smart select rating okay. here. So, okay. mm -hmm. But that's a that's a great tip, though. I'll have to uh, have to see what what other kind of stocks that would bring up. Because mm -hmm. sometimes, yeah, those short term bursts can be very fun to trade. Mm -hmm. So I have a comp rating in here. This is not absolutely necessary, but it, for me, it's a kind of safety uh, valve because the comp rating incorporates uh a number of things, including real earnings growth and acceleration yeah. margins and things like that. And then one of my favorite parameters, and you'll only find this in MarketSmith, and that is the SMR rating. It stands for sales growth. So that matches the sales uh, to price to sales ratio quite nicely. Um, margins, which is your mm -hmm. measure of safety, what, what Warren Buffett calls the moat. And Return on equity is the R, and that to me signals very good management. A company that has very good management is able to return strong income on the equity of the company. So if you have an SMR of A or B, you're already in the top 40% of stocks that are out there with respect to those three things. You don't have to have the SMR in there, but I like to have it. It's just my favorite sector, and all of my scans in incorporate that to some degree. Uh -huh. So we have 15 stocks that pass through our filter. And if we scroll down, we can take a good look at some of these. Now, I've already done this and I did find a, a, a couple that I did like uh, quite a bit. And I also took all these over to tip ranks okay. and was able to whittle it down to a couple that are listed at a strong buy. Uh -huh. um, but let's go ahead and take a look at some of these charts just so we get a good feel of what companies that satisfy all those requirements look like. So you can see that uh, this is an energy play and it is up near the highs. And this is Liberty Energy. High. LBRT is the ticker symbol here. LBRT, mm -hmm. right. Uh, and you can see it's doing a nice little pullback along with the market. It's still above the 50 period moving average, a 200 period moving average. And uh, this is a nice little uh, oversold pullback setup that mm -hmm. is already uh, showing your oversold stochastics and kind of a nice little entry right there on the hammer candle today. Yeah. Uh, but it was not I one saw that... a lot of those today. And uh, yeah, a lot of these, a lot of these uh, pullbacks. <laughs> Actually, not just oil and gas and, and, a, and a lot yeah. of stocks. Now, uh, quick question, though, um, when you're dealing with something uh, like in the oil and gas space that tends yeah. to be cyclical, how often, you know, I mean, price 
price to sales, um, you know, estimate revisions, all of these things are not normally something that you would think of using with a cyclical stock. Uh, do you do you typically get cyclical stocks in there? Well, yeah, we get all kinds. We get we do get uh, retail. We get um, uh, you know consumer cyclical stocks in there quite a mm -hmm. bit. What we're doing is we're isolating or highlighting stocks that are in favor right now. Yeah. And so energy stocks, although they've had a little bit of a blip, but some of these oil and gas pipeline companies are doing really well. And uh, yeah. And right. So this this scan will highlight stocks that are very much in favor with the market right now. And we're taking a short term uh, uh, view on mm -hmm. their forward momentum. And when that momentum wanes, we'll be out there. As I said before, there are ways that we use to uh, to determine that. But um, yeah, so I'm and, not worried. And, and if we go back to LBRT, because um, because you mentioned the stochastics, and you know, just for for people that um, do have Market Smith, uh, this is something that you can just go to the wrench in the top right hand corner, um, and you can add the stochastics um, if if you want to see those. So uh, just just real quickly, can you describe? what what it is that you're looking for you mentioned oversold so uh are you using that 20 uh kind of criteria it, it getting to below 20 for the, the the fast line the slow line how are you using these stochastics well stochastics is the um, measurement of current price to a range of prices over a given period I'll look back uh, I don't know right. exactly what uh, stochastics is set at here, but usually the default is I, a 14 period. I, 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 I believe it is 14 days. Yeah. 14 period. Yeah. So yeah. Um, because stochastics is down now under 20, which is a pretty rare signal for a uh, trending market, that means that it's trading at the lower end of the range over the last 14 days. And you can see that pretty much from the yeah. price it's reflected mm -hmm. in the price. Mm -hmm. So that's and we, we want stocks that are trading uh, near just off or bouncing off of support. Support can come in all kinds of ways, but the best and strongest support is always uh, former price pivots, former price areas of resistance that now can become support. So one of the things I'll be looking for here in a stock like this, a setup like this, not just the over oversold stochastics, but how is it in relationship to former pivot highs? Now, MarketSmith will mark those. So right. here's a form of pivot high 1659, and it is now the price of this stock is uh, where is the price of 1603? 1603. Mm -hmm. Sorry, mm -hmm. my eyesight not real good. <laughs> so it is a little bit below that one, but it is certainly above the most recent um, previous pivot high now support. It is above mm -hmm. the 200, above the 50. So not a bad, uh, not a bad setup. The 50 period moving average is rising. The 20 period moving average is falling flat, but it's not falling at least. Yeah. Um, but again, this one did not uh, pass the the uh, tip ranks test, okay. the analyst okay. test. Mm -hmm. Let me show you one that did. And I actually bought this stock yesterday from this and scan. And uh, this is uh, Celestica. Uh, ticker Celestica. symbol is CLS on this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a company that, uh, what do they do? I just, I looked at their website yesterday when I was digging down yeah, into the company. Uh, electronic contract manufacturing. So yeah, um, yeah, yeah. this is an area yeah. that, uh, you know, some of the industrial stocks have been doing uh, fairly, right. fairly well lately. And, you know, they took a little they bit of a the break. They make the tech that help companies uh, uh, make their products more efficiently, you know, measurements and that kind of thing. So, uh, and it's doing a nice little, you know, got a big bump up on earnings, is holding uh, the 20 period, the 20 price level very nicely. Uh, three days of upside, very good volume balance down here, RS rating of 99. And if you go over to tip ranks, you're going to see that it's at a strong buy and there are several five-star analysts uh, in support. Mm -hmm. So this looks good from all angles. Uh, this would be one that you could buy. You would hold on to it. And where would you get out? Well, that's a bit of an art rather than a science. But if you're using something like the LRC or Bollinger Bands, which measure standard deviation against a mean, then you would sell once it gets up into that area, up into the top area, above the, the, the two, upper two Bollinger standard Band. Uh, two standard two, deviation. Two, two, right. 2.0 standard deviation. Um, I use a an overlay. So I use a 1.5 and a 2.0 standard deviation for the linear regression channel. And it gives a nice little uh, pink band at the bottom. 
and mm -hmm. a blue band at the top between the 1.5 and 2.0. And uh, my motto in my live trading room is uh, let's buy the pink and let's sell the blue. Okay. <laughs> and mm -hmm. rinse and repeat. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so that, that looks good. I like CLS. It would be one that I could recommend. I even have my my uh, live trading room in shares. I'm in shares myself. My trend mm -hmm. trading letter is in shares of, of CLS. Mm -hmm. uh, another one that looked good, if I could go down and find it here. There it is, APG. So this is a little different kind of setup. It's not the breakout setup of, of a, a CLS. This is more of a pullback setup. Mm -hmm. But it's a very shallow pullback, and it's been in a range from 20 to 30, almost 30. And that's a pretty sizable range, right? 10, 10 points on a $25 stock. So this has some good movement to it. We want to see that. We want to see a stock that is able to move, not in a tight little 5% range over months and months. We don't want that. Um, nice pullback to the rising 50 period moving average. The 20 is in there somewhere. I don't really see it. <laughs> and uh, kind of hard on my small laptop. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's just below there. So it's it's kind just of below. Yeah. Uh, the, the the 21 day moving average line, or is that your, your 20? Right. Uh, yeah. So we've got stochastics uh, exactly where we want them. They're, mm -hmm. they're well below 20 with a fresh buy signal. Uh, it does look like it's it satisfied the market smith. Uh, breakout technical signal here at 2384 when it broke above that. Mm -hmm. And I suspect that it's going to create a new buy signal when it gets up above 2957 for a whole new leg higher. Mm -hmm. um, so and, this and definitely, good. definitely very tight action here. If you go to the weekly chart, you can see that, you know, this has um, uh, that blue shading area letting you know that uh -huh. it's had, um, you know, a lot of tight closes. So really, uh, this wasn't uh, so much of a pullback to the 10 week line as it was here. I'll wait here and let you catch up to me. You know, type right. thing, it seems right. like, um, and, and I just, just real quick, you know, I, want to, I want to ask you, it seems like, you know, a lot of these stocks that you're talking about, it's really pullbacks that you're looking at to a large degree. Well, it, it will bring up pullbacks and that's partly because of the valuation filter. So, a stock, would, when it's trading up at the 52-week highs, probably won't pass under 1.0 price to sales. It pulls back 5%, 10%. Suddenly, it's under 1.0 price to sales. So that's another way that you can use, another technique you can use to get out of the trade when it has gone up quite a bit. If you run the scan a week later, two weeks later, and the stock has fallen off, then something is no longer fitting that mm -hmm. system and it's time to sell. Yeah. Very, very, uh, very cool stuff. Any, any final thoughts from you? Well, uh, and more importantly, where does it close tomorrow? Yeah, yeah, because yeah. we've had uh, quite a few days that gap up we, what we call a gap and crap rather than a gap <laughs> and go. Uh, uh -huh. and the important thing of any stock that rises on earnings is that it holds that gap because the market is saying, Hey, we, we are valuing this at a new level. Right. And we, if it doesn't hold that level, then the market overshot. Yeah. So we want yeah. to see it hold that, keep that gap open. Um, yeah, I would just su suggest uh, to folks if they want to learn a little bit more about various kinds of trading that I do, uh, that they might think about joining me in my live trading room. And you can do that through StockTwits. Go to my mm, okay. profile and you'll see a link there to that. And I every Tuesday and Thursday, I hold a live chart session where we go through charts and we look at you know what's happening in the market, what are, what are the hot sectors and what are the stocks setting up nicely and what are the fangs doing and so on. Mm -hmm. And I take chart requests so folks can tell me what stock they're interested in. Awesome. Um, one, of the, one of the tips I would give to anybody trading, especially if you're still kind of new to it, it, that is to have a variety of approaches. I, I used to be just a pullback trader, only trading mm -hmm. pullbacks, and it's still my bread and butter. It's still my favorite system. But I learned to trade breakouts. I learned to trade deep oversold bounces. I learned to trade stocks that seem like they're never going to fall, and we short those. Um, but you have to have a variety of different uh, approaches to the market. You know, diversification is oversold as a, you know a way of getting you into a whole big basket of stocks. That's not helpful. But diversification of approaches is very important. Yeah. Try to have yeah. one or two positions on at any one time that take different angles of the market and are doing different things on the charts. Yeah. Um, 
And I would also say to folks, you know, start small. One of the biggest problems I have with newbie traders is that they want to put everything into one stock and really, you know, make, make their bucks quick. I got to make money small. now. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. That's it. Just start very small and you, you learn the skills, learn what works, what doesn't work. Um, test your, your, your emotional metal, because boy, it sure takes a lot of emotional strength to stick with the market through thick and thin yeah. and uh, keep your sizes to a level where you can sleep at night. Yeah. Very important. Well, Dr. Thomas Carr, also known as Dr. Stocks, thank you so much for joining the show again. Uh, always a pleasure chatting with you, and uh, we'll we'll see you next time. Thanks a lot for being here. Thank you, Justin. My pleasure. See you all. Okay. Um, and that's going to wrap it up for the show this week. Next week, we've got David Ryan, uh, three-time U.S. investing champion. Um, I, you know, he holds a special place in my heart. He's on IBD Live every Tuesday with us. And uh, when I first saw Bill O'Neill speak. David Ryan was right there next to him in November of 1997. So he was a Bill O'Neill protege, uh, you know, ran money for him uh, for the new USA mutual fund. So uh, we're going to get his thoughts on the market, get some lessons from him. So always a pleasure there. Thank you so much for watching us this week and we'll see you next time. Take care.